My talk really is about a third way to the future and you might be looking at me and thinking well what future has the speaker got? I put a little bit of music on my slides just to keep people awake <laughs> but um, if you say why, why should I worry about a future which obviously I'm not going to see in fact I've got four excellent reasons why I want the future to be sustainable because I've got grandchildren and much to their embarrassment, I'm sure, I'm showing them a slide. There they are, <laughs> Isaac, Alex, Charlotte and Sean. And of course, by 2050, they will be at the height of their careers. And I'd like to think that they would enjoy the sort of life that we've been enjoying. But of course, we're told that, of course, that is not likely to happen if we continue along the current pathway. But what do we need for a civilised life? Well, obviously, wholesome food. That goes without saying. Clean water, we take that for granted. Transport fuel, we like to move around easily, and we never particularly wed it to the car now. We like medical drugs because we know that during our lifetime we're going to uh, sustain various illnesses. We like good quality housing. We all live in that sort of housing in, in a country like this. We like material possessions. Like me, you think there's just too much stuff around these days, but we, we like these things. And of course, we want time for recreation. We want to be able to do things to enjoy sport and interacting with other people. And of course, these things today rely very heavily on the agrochemical, the chemical and the pharmaceutical industries, these basic chemistry derived industries to uh, provide them. And of course, if we're going to get to 2050 and we want to enjoy the same thing, then I hope to show you that it is possible we can go down the chemical route. Well, let's look at the first priority for a civilised life, and of course, that is sustainable food. Now, we know what's happening in the world. There are currently 7 billion of us. I think we passed the 7 billion mark sometime last, towards the end of last year. The forecast is 9 billion of us by 2050. Of course, the world's population today will increase by 80,000. And in fact, by 2050, they will have increased to the extent of about 400 cities the size of London, extra on the planet and the people living in them. Now those seem large figures, but if you do the sums, that's what is going on at the moment. Everyone will need to be fed, <coughs> sorry, to be fed at the level that we enjoy. Well, chemists solved this problem, of course, quite a while ago. Chemists solved this problem when there were only three billion of us in 1960 or so. We produced polyurethane condoms, which of course don't split, not like the old latex uh, condoms that we, we relied on 50 years ago. We've got the pill now, which has given women control of their fertility. And we've got the morning after pill, when of course nature takes over and in the morning after you think perhaps you didn't do the right thing. And of course, as the birth rate, as, as living standards improve, as we know, birth rate tends to decrease. But even so, allowing for that, I think 9 billion is about what we'll see in 2050 and of course despite what chemists have done to make it possible to avoid that uh, we're still going to think go down that route. Now the curious thing just to give you an example of where chemists did play a, a major role in 1960 another 3 billion of us there was 1.3 billion hectares of farmland sustaining this population. Now a hectare if you're not familiar with there are 100 hectares in a square kilometre. Now there are 7 billion of us and yet the amount of farmed land has only increased by about 10%. And that, of course, has been possible because of intensively farmed land. We are now able to grow more on the same amount of land thanks to the input from the agrochemical industries, mainly in the form of fertilisers to produce larger crops and pesticides to control the competing things who want to eat our crops. It might be possible to feed 9 billion people on two billion hectares on that pro rata ratio. We've got to do, make adjustments. We want more GM food and things like that. But you can see it's not totally crowding out wildlife. The land area of this planet is 15 billion hectares. And of course, we would then say two of that. So we're not going to crowd out wildlife too badly if we continue the, around the present thing. Of course, I don't think we really want to do that. Just to put it all in perspective, the land area of the UK is 0.024 billion, 24 million. And of course, can we do things with that? Well, part of my talk is to show that that may happen. Now, the thing about agriculture, modern, it needs fertilizers. 
sustainable food will need sustainable fertilizers. And of course, we know that the main additives in fertilizers are nitrogen, phosphorus, and, pot and potassium. Of course, if we know that a particular area of land is depleted of certain essential met metals, then we can add those to the fertilizer in trace elements. Some land is lacking selenium, other land is lacking uh, things like zinc. So we can add things like that to get a balanced fertilizer. Can we produce these sustainably? Well, of course, the agrochemical Agrochemical industry makes ammonium nitrate, which is the fertilizer for crop production. And of course, to do it, it has to use vast amounts of fossil energy. Now, I'd like to think it, that all might be done by sustainable energy. I could see perhaps in 2050 that around the country there'll be small units producing ammonium nitrate. We know the science behind it, just a bit of chemistry there. If you use electricity, you can break water down into hydrogen and oxygen. It's the hydrogen you want. The nitrogen comes from the atmosphere. You combine the two in the, in the Haber-Bosch process. You get ammonia. You oxidize some of that ammonia to nitric acid. Then you react the two together and you get ammonium nitrate. Possible? But can it be done on a smaller scale? Well, given the right catalyst, it might be possible. There is an alternative method of fixing nitrogen, and that's one that was used when, you, when they had a lot of surplus energy like in Norway, the Birklandite process, if you just pass the electric discharge through air, then nitrogen and oxygen react to form uh, nitric oxide and from that you can produce nitrates. But of course that's an energy intensive one. Now the Born Haber one that produces the ammonium nitrate has been around for about 100 years. In fact, if it, these plants were to stop production, then half the population of the planet would be, we couldn't feed them anymore because we now fix about as much nitrogen as nature fixes. So we do need it, we're linked to this. And of course, currently the process for doing this uses high temperatures and high pressures, hence the need for a lot of fossil energy. A couple of years ago, a breakthrough occurred in this area. A new catalyst was discovered that works at 50 degrees centigrade and normal pressures. And there, for the people who are interested, it's a ruthenium compound and as I say, this was announced about two years ago. So it looks as though if we're going down this route, it might be possible to have local methods of producing ammonium nitrate fertilizer using sustainable energy, perhaps from a windmill or something like that. Phosphate, of course, doesn't present a problem. We can extract phosphate from sewage. Human beings consume far more phosphate than the body needs. I know it's our bones are calcium phosphate, but we're passing a lot of phosphate out into the sewage system. And nowadays, of course, it's extracted from sewage because if it gets into rivers, it gets into lakes, you get eutrophication, you get massive growth of algae, and it spoils the lake or the river for other wildlife. So we are already extracting phosphate. That's never going to be a problem as long as we continue doing extracting and putting it back on the land. Potassium does pose a problem because although all plants contain a lot of potassium, and we're going to process plants to produce other things, at the end of the day, so well, of course, there will be the potassium left but there will never be enough potassium to return it to the land to sustain agriculture. Because the thing about modern life is you crop the land, it goes to the city, then it goes out through the sewers. Well, of course, there's no process I know for extracting potassium from sewage. And so we're relying at the moment on mined potassium in the form of potassium chloride. Ultimately, of course, this isn't going to be sustainable, but thankfully this planet has got vast deposits of potassium chloride, which can be mined. In fact, we've got one in Britain, in Yorkshire, at Boolby, there's a mine that's a great big seam of potassium chloride, mounds of it, and we can now produce about half the potassium chloride we need for farming. We still have to import a lot, but we can produce it. But there's no process as yet for reclaiming it from sewage, although I'm sure it would be possible. Well, of course, when it comes to sustainability, then it's carbon that we all talk about. And of course, if we're not going to use fossil carbon, the only other source of carbon is the atmosphere. Now, thankfully, plants can extract carbon from the atmosphere extremely well. They do it to the extent of 90 billion tons a year. Convert it to other things that we need is what skills chemists are going to have to provide. Just to do a quick summary of the situation we've got now and where we're going, 
fossil carbon, which comes from the planet. It's reduced carbon. It's there as carbon, coal or oil, CH2, or as methane gas, CH4. There's about 10,000 billion tonnes of carbon that we could access this way. Of course, we couldn't do with that because, of course, we would ruin the planet. And you can see we take about 10 billion tonnes of that carbon every day, or every year, sorry, for the last, to support the lifestyle we exist. Now, of course, floating above us, there's a thousand billion tonnes of carbon in the atmosphere, mainly as carbon dioxide. And of course, as I say, plants are very good at extracting that to produce biomass, mainly in the form of carbohydrate. And of course, that's where, in 2050, we hope all the carbon that we, we need <coughs> will be coming from. But of course, there's an exchange between carbon as plants decay, carbon goes back into the atmosphere. But that's the situation. We do actually waste carbon in a rather unexpected way, and that's by the production of iron. Now, iron, of course, is the metal we produce, produce on a vast quantity, 2.4 billion tonnes a year, and every tonne of iron releases half a tonne of carbon monoxide to the atmosphere. Now, this is a vast waste of carbon, in a way, and one company is now doing something about this. Lanzatech in Italy, has found a way of trapping that carbon monoxide and converting it to two very useful materials, mainly to ethanol, which of course can be used as a fuel. And they do it very simply, simply cooling the gas and bubbling it through a aqueous phase that contains microbes, and there are microbes now, which can digest carbon monoxide and turn it into ethanol. And in Japan, uh, sorry, in China now, there is a plant doing just that, and one can see that all around the world, by 2050, every major iron producer will have one of these plants plugged into their system. So we will be trapping that. This, of course, is not solving the problem in a way, because to make an iron, you need coke. And we know coke comes from coal, so it's a, a fossil fuel. But this is just preventing waste of a fossil fuel that we're now wasting on a large scale. Just how much our carbon is in the Earth's crust? Now, this is a little puzzle. I, tell people this and it's a rather strange result that you get. If we assume that all the oxygen in the atmosphere has come from carbon dioxide as a result of photosynthesis, <coughs> then for every oxygen atom molecule in the atmosphere there must be a reduced carbon in the crust of the planet. The total amount of oxygen in the atmosphere is 1 times 10 to the 15 tonnes. That's an incredible number. I think, is that a billion, mil, a billion, a million, billion, billion? Therefore, in the crust, there must be, you can work out, it's simple chemistry, 0.375 billion, billion tonnes of carbon in the crust of this planet. The amount we extract every year is 10.6 times 10 to the nan. That's the figure given out the BBC, uh, the BP Statistical Review for this year we're only extracting a relatively small amount of carbon from the crust, 0.003% per year. Now, of course, we can't extract all the carbon because we'd ruin the planet. But when you hear people saying we're going to run out of oil or gas or something like that, then this isn't strictly true. The danger is, of course, that we will continue to rely on this as a source of energy, and numbers like that will suggest that this may be a route that a lot of people will advocate. But of course, if we're going to accept sustainable carbon has to come from the atmosphere, then of course it will come via biomass. And we know that we can farm the biomass for triglycerides, which are plant oils, for carbohydrates, which is sugar, starch, or cellulose, lignin, of course, which is what, what wood is mainly is. Or we can convert biomass to syngas. Now, syngas is a material we'll be hearing a lot about. If you treat any biomass with high temperature steam under the right pressure, what you do is you break it down to carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And that, that mixture is known as syngas. Microbes, of course, on the other hand, can do something else for us. They can turn biomass into methane. And I think this will be a big thing in the future because we could actually grow lots of crops um, and produce biomass. Just to give you an example of one fast-growing one, elephant grass. That grows very rapidly, it can be harvested, it gives an enormous amount of biomass, 
per hectare per year, grows very rapidly, and of course this could be a resource we could use. Some people are doing it for themselves already. <laughs> it just shows you how fertile land can be. That's someone, I think that was in Southampton a couple of years ago, allowed Leilandio just to go wild in their front garden. But it just shows you how you, we could in fact crop land very successfully for biomass. That's the Blue Danube. This is, I'm going to talk about water now. <laughs> um, but the other, next sustainable thing is we want clean water. Now, as we probably know, we rely very heavily for cl clean water on the benefits that the chemical industry has brought. With all water that's natural, you've got to get rid of various impurities like particulates. It might be cloudy. Microbes, of course, we don't want pathogens in the water supply like I mean, some waterborne diseases are quite terrible, typhoid, meningitis, cholera. We don't want inorganics there. We don't want traces of metals that we know are not good for us, like arsenic. We don't want organics. Now, of course, chemists can remove all those. The simple trick, of course, is to put aluminium sulfate solution into water. It forms a flock of aluminium hydroxides, and as that's settled, it carries most of this down with it. So that's the way we can purify water. But, of course, it's... Maybe, of course, we know earlier this year because we had a drought technically in Britain. Believe it or not, you tend to think of reverse osmosis as something that countries will have where the water supply, where rainfall cannot be guaranteed. You know, islands like Lanzarote, for example, exist on reverse osmosis. You take seawater and you push the water out. It's a simple chemical process. Um, you get these desalination plants, as they're called, in southern Europe. We tend to think we don't need them in northern Europe, but believe it or not, we've got one in Britain. There's the desalination plant now, which takes water from the Thames and produces pure water. It was built to su supplement in times of need. If something happened to the main supply, then this could produce clean water. And I think this year it actually has been working. It's drinking water, of course, needs to be drinkable. That I know you understand what I mean. This free of disease pathogens, it's got to, whatever you do it, it's got to protect the water supply from the treatment plant to the tap. Now you can purify water with ozone. That will kill all the bugs you don't want in it. But by the time it's gone through this uh, piping to the tap, the ozone is long gone. It's got to be safe to drink. It's got to be cheap to use for even the poorest countries in the world. And of course there is one thing that does that beautifully, sodium hypochlorite, the thing we've been using in Britain now for well over 100 years. And people say, oh, it's, it can chlorinate things. But, of course, always remember that hypochlorite is something the body produces naturally. Our own immune system tends to use it as well. So it's not dangerous. People don't like it. An over-chlorinated water supply. And, of course, people say, well, of course, it's dangerous to drink chlorine like that. But, of course, it isn't really. And, of course, sodium hypochlorite is going to be sustainable as long as there's salt in the sea and a supply of electricity. We don't ship it around in tankers as liquid chlorine anymore. Of course, you won't want awful accidents with that. And in fact, there are now simple hypochlorite generators on site where they're needed. They make a 1% solution, which is adequate for making water safe to drink. And those are examples of them. You can write an large sale to supply town water supply with clean water or even micro generators if you perhaps just use it for a small swimming pool or something like that. So all this has now been done by chemists. So with that case, we don't need to worry too much about that. There's even some work done for Arvia. It's a, a spin-off company from the University of Manchester. And this simple plant will take wastewater from any plant and purify it. It does by absorbing impurities onto carbon, then destroying them by uh, electrolysis, and then recycling. So this means you just need nothing more than a 13-amp plug, and you can reprocess continually the water without discharging it to a river where, of course, it would perhaps add to the burden of pollution on that river. We like moving around, we want transport fuel. This is where we've got to think seriously about what we're doing. We've got cars that run on petrol, lorries and buses that run on diesel, aircraft that run on paraffin, ships that run on oil. And of course these transport needs are made met from oil, and of the oil that's extracted every year from the Earth's crust, half of it goes into providing fuels for these. 
Now, can we do all this with biofuels? Well, let's look at the energy. This is where we've got to look carefully. Petrol and diesel will provide you with 32 millijoules per litre. First generation biofuels, biodiesel, will provide you with almost that amount. Bioethanol, of course, produces, produces a lot less energy, so you have to burn more of it. But, of course, that's not too bad. The second generation biofuels, which will be here by 2050 in a large way, biomethanol, even less, but much easier to produce. Biobutanol, which has got a higher energy content, almost as good as petrol, and the plants are now being built for that. Third generation biofuel is the one, of course, that we talk a lot about but never seems to arrive. That's biohydrogen, and the energy that that can provide is truly enormous. But, of course, people are a bit cagey about it. Well, let's look at some of these biofuels in a little closer. Bioethanol. Brazil's the main producer of this. It produces it to the extent of 26 billion litres, and it produces it from sugar cane. Now, when you tell people that, it uses about 1% of their uh, agricultural land. They say, of course, all this is cutting into the Amazon rainforest. This shouldn't be allowed. But in fact, it isn't. Farming of sugar cane occurs about a thousand miles south of the Amazon rainforest. So there's no competition there. In the UK, we make it from surplus grain. We grow more grain than we need, and we make about, or we will be fairly soon making about 420 million litres per year. In Britain, our attempt to do this was undermined by the subsidised bioethanol that was being imported from America. In order to encourage farmers in America to produce bioethanol from corn, the starch of corn, it was heavily subsidised. And of course people in Europe were buying this subsidised bioethanol and importing it into Europe. Well of course that's now come to an end. And the plant that was built at Wilton, the Ensus plant, is about to go back onto production and will be producing 400 million litres a year by fermenting wheat. And, with a bit of luck, more of this will, will come. I mean, it may be, you know, if there's ever a food crisis, you wouldn't possibly send wheat to a, bio a biofuels plant. But while we're producing surpluses, then this is one way of using it up. I'll come to others in a minute. In Italy, they've gone a slightly better step. They've, a biorenewables, the company's called, uses actually March cane grass. It's a bit like elephant grass. It grows very readily. And they're using it. And they've found enzymes that can break down the cellulose in this plant to produce bioethanol. And again, they're building a big plant which will help Italy become more or less dependent on fossil fuels by producing more bioethanol. Biodiesel, of course, is a thing which would be best for us to produce. That's a bit of simple chemistry. Biodiesel is made from plant oils, or can be made from animal fats as well. Um, and a it's a, what's called a triglyceride, and you can see at this end you've got the glycerol molecule, and attached to it are these long ch hydrocarbon chains, and those, of course, are very rich in energy. They're just carbon and hydrogen. And if you can break the bond between the glycerol and the hydrocarbons, you've got biodiesel. And, of course, biodiesel, all you need to do is react it with sodium methanoate, which releases these acids, and you get the glycerol and the methyl esters of the biodiesel, and believe it or not, animal fats in America, there's a big factory that turns chicken fat into biodiesel. It's even possible to use human fat, as shown by Peter Bethune in 2008. There he is with his trimaran. And he gave up 80 grams of his body fat to convert to biodiesel. And how far did it move in tri trimaran? 50 metres, about from here to the other side of the square. But nevertheless, he wanted to prove a point, and he, which he did. Normal di um, biomass can actually be made to better diesel. Instead of just breaking the bonds between the triglycerides and the glycerol, if you wrap the whole thing with hydrogen, then you get something more like proper diesel, and you get propane gas from the glycerol. Both very useful. And there's a company in Finland which is doing just that, and I'm sure companies like that will be established in Britain. The thing about this type of diesel, biodiesel, it doesn't turn to jelly. Now that was a big embarrassment to Norwich City Council a few years ago. They converted all their buses to biodiesel and then one cold morning none of them would start. 
because the biodiesel is set like jelly in the fuel tanks. So yes, there are problems with that, um, and this type of biodiesel, of course, will be just like ordinary diesel, it wouldn't turn to jelly. Could we run all our cars in Britain on biodiesel? Now, it sounds almost impossible, but look at the numbers. The average car in Britain travels about 10,000 miles a year, which is about 16,000 kilometres. If it went at 40 kilometres per litre, then it would need 400 litres of biodiesel a year. Well, one company is getting near to that, and that's the Honda Insight, which would deliver 30 kilometres per litre. And I'm pretty sure by 2050. Of course, the car like that is still using most of its energy to move itself. I'm sure, pretty sure by 2050, they will reach this target of 40 kilometres per litre. Now, could we still do it? In Britain at the moment, we've got 30 million cars. And if we were to follow that formula, we'd need 12,000 million litres of biodiesel per year. To grow that, we'd need... 3 million hectares of crops like rape. <laughs> Oops, sorry. At the moment, we get about 4,000 litres per hectare. I'm sure, given uh, uh, more research in this area, that could be raised to 5,000. And it is possible. It is just possible that this country could produce all the biodiesel it needs. Truth, the hidden side of this, of course, is these crops would need fertilisers like everything else. It's not just a question of growing them and cropping and growing and cropping. We'd have to look into that more closely. So look at what Britain's got. We've got 24 million hectares of land. 4% is urban. 3.4. 12% is woodland and forest. 90% is farmland. 52% is grassland. And 3% is set aside. And you can see that if we need 3 million hectares to grow biodiesel, which supply all our cars, then in fact we wouldn't have to give up much grassland and give up the set-aside, obviously. It is just possible that we could do it. Now, whether we've got the will to do it, of course, is another thing. Second generation biofuels are coming along. Biomethanol is being produced. There's a glut of glycerol in the world at the moment. As you separate made biodiesel, you get masses of glycerol produced, and it's very cheap. A Dutch company is now converting that to methanol on a large scale. I'm sure that could be done in Britain as well. We can make methanol from syngas. This gas I was telling you about, you can convert bio biomass to carbon, monoxide and hydrogen. Those two molecules will react together quite happily. They'll give out energy as they do so to produce methanol. Now, methanol is like ethanol. It's a liquid. It's very good. It can fuel cars. And in fact, in America... They, for a while, they turned to methanol as a fuel in certain cities where there was a lot of heavy pollution because burning this didn't cause the same sort of smog. Uh, and they used 85% methanol, 15% petrol, and that was used in the 1880s. They don't do it now. But it showed that methanol could be used as a fuel. And in fact, it, it was used in racing cars and still is, to my knowledge, simply because if you're going to have dangerous races and you have a collision and they're fueled with petrol, for example, then you get a fireball if the tank ruptures and its uh, uh, fuel ignites. If that happens to a methanol, it doesn't do that. It burns, but it burns quietly. There's no fireball, there's nothing like that. So it's still used. We can even, we've even got INEOS, which is a British company, although it's now based in Switzerland, that can produce, convert syngas to bioethanol. They've worked out a process for doing this, so we could use syngas to produce bioethanol, which, as I say, is, is a better fuel in a way. Another second generation biofuel is biobutanol. That's got a chain of carbon atoms. There's a bacterium that will produce it from sugar, and you can mix this with petrol up to 50-50%, and it doesn't... It, 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 you don't need to modify the engine in order to burn it. So it's potentially a good one. We're going to produce 14 million litres, not very much, of biobutanol, because we now produce a surplus beet crop. People don't eat sugar as they used to do, but we still grow sugar on a large scale, and it's going to be used. And DuPont and BP have collaborated, and the biobutanol plant is now being built at Hull to produce this particular fuel. So again, we could go down that route as well. Of course, I'm talking about transport. There's, I'm afraid there's an element, elephant in the room 
of sustainable fuel. I think some of you already thought about it. It's the jumbo. And of course, air transport requires vast amounts of fuel. And if you were to want to fly the Atlantic on biofuel, you'd need each trip would burn up 20 hectares of biofuel per trip. Now, it's just possible there is enough land in the planet for all our aircraft to be fueled with biofuels. But I think by 2050, people will begin to say, do we need all this? Can't we transport, trans move around on trains or, or even ships again as a better and safer way and more economical? The third generation biofuel, of course, which we can hear a lot about but never seems to arrive, which is liquid hydrogen. Now, of course, you can produce liquid hydrogen from syngas. You can separate it from, from the carbon monoxide, or you can just produce it by the hydrolysis of water if you've got a surplus energy. Even though its boiling point is minus 250 degrees centigrade, it has been used in cars and buses. Fuel tanks have been designed, which will hold this liquid at that temperature. There's 71 layers of insulation around these tanks, but they've been made. It is possible. We've even devised solids which will so store hydrogen as though it was a liquid much safer in a way, and there are cars which will do this. In Birmingham University has a fleet of cars fueled with liquid hydrogen, um, but of course they buy their liquid hydrogen uh, commercially. It arrives in a tanker and it's not being generated on site, but it, they're showing that it can be done. You can have liquid hydrogen driven cars. There aren't many songs in which the word plastic appears, <laughs> but, but I'm a Barbie girl, is one of them, so I, I pinched that. And of course, look around us in our everyday life, and we rely heavily on polymers. Of course, they're wonderful materials, but of course, they're mainly based on carbon. There are silicone polymers, which are fluids, but most of the polymers that we use are based on carbon. Now, if we're going to have a sustainable future based on those, it'll have to come from biomass. There's no other source for it. An example of a biopolymer is guillain biopolymer. Here they are. There are things made from it. This is one that's produced from cellulose. If you relax cellulose with sorbitol, you re relax cellulose with hydrogen, you can produce sorbitol. There's the molecule. And you can get rid of dehydrating, get rid of some of the water, the oxygen and the hydrogens, and you get this molecule as a sorbide. And you can polymerize that, and you get that polymer guillain. That's going to be important in the future. Polyacrylates are going to be important. We use a lot of polyacrylates. Microbes can convert sugar to 3-hydroxypropionic acid. And then, of course, you can go to acrylic acid. Around the planet, 4.5 million tonnes of this are produced every year because we use it. I mean, all the, that acrylic acid is produced from fossil, fossil derivatives. We use it for perspex, rubbers, glues, paints. Polyacrylates are everywhere. I mean, even... Pampers contain them. Polyacrylic acid is the wonderful absorbent in Pampers, as you probably know. Uh, and absorb, uh, uh, and Pamper will absorb ten times its weight of urine. And I used to have to uh, validate these for television adverts. And a Pamper will in, uh, accept four insults, as they're called, from a child, and the skin, the baby's skin, will still remain dry. There's no, uh, not that terrible nappy lash that used to be around years ago. And, of course, it's polyacrylic acid that's producing that. So we do need polyacrylates, but, again, they can be produced, no problem there. But, of course, we want to produce more sophisticated polymers as well, not just these two. Uh, in Germany, we've got a plant that's turning biomaterial into alkanes. Now, alkanes are needed if you're going to make alkenes, and alkenes are the source of polymers. And they also enable us to make benzene, which is another component of polymers. And if we want to make sustainable plastics of the type we're more familiar with, then this is going to pose some problems. That's, what, that's the simplest one of all. Ethene at this, ethylene at this side. Polymerize it, it joins into long chains, and you've got polythene. Very useful polymer. And, of course, there are other polymers like it. There's PVC, which you've got chlorine atoms on some of the carbons. This Teflon, that wonderful polymer that, to which nothing sticks, where you've got fluorines on the carbons. Now, we want those to continue. What we've got to ensure is that ethylene, ethene is produced. And believe it or not, it's already being manufactured in Brazil, where they've got a surplus of ethanol. It's very easy to turn ethanol into ethylene. Or, sorry, the technical name is ethene, but most people still call it ethylene. 
and they've now got a plant there which is making 200,000 tonnes of biopolythene from bioethanol from sugarcane a year. So they're already moving down that route. One polymer that's rather sad and which we discovered in Britain was carillon. Now carillon is made from carbon monoxide and ethene, ethylene. The two react together and it was wonderful material. It was strong, it was heat resistant, it could cope with corrosive chemicals. It was ideal for all sorts of things like piping, gear wheels, undersea equipment, shell was ready to produce it and then for suddenly they took the decision to leave chemicals altogether and carillon was never produced. About 10,000 tons were but manufacturers stopped. Now that one obviously is one that should come back in 2050 because the resource materials are going to be available. What about other plastics? Now some plastics of course have got benzene as part of their chemical structure. Polyester, of course most clothes and 90% of our clothing now is polyester that contains benzene rings. Polystyrene, we know about that. Kevlar, of course, the plastic that can stop a bullet. We know that that's got benzene rings and that's the structure of it there. You can see the benzene rings. Victrex, wonderful new plastic. Again, a British invention. It's, there's a company, Victrex, which manufactures it. That's got benzene rings. That's the plastic you're going to have your artificial joints made of because it's biocompatible with the body and it's very stable. Very strong as well. And of course, can we make benzene from syngas? Well, yes, we can, because if you've got the right catalyst, you can turn syngas into hexane, and of course, hexane can be turned into benzene. Just to show you something rather nice, when you make these plastics, these extreme plastics that we're beginning more and more to rely on, you need to test them. And one industry which is more than happy to help us test these is the F1 people who make F1 cars. And you can see some, I'm going to show you some rather dramatic film now, of just how good some of these things really are. Now this was the McGann Cup two years ago, in fact on this day two years ago, and it was run at Silverstone, and one of the cars was driven by Caroline Griffney. Watch. <laughs> Perfectly safe, protected in a pod. Oops, sorry. Protected in a pod made of these wonderful extreme plastics. Let's move on now. Priority number five: sustainable cities. Can we ever have sustainable cities? Bit of inspiring music there for you. Cities need energy. We need to reduce this. So by 2050, we don't want energy flowing into cities in quite the level it flows in at the moment. We need energy for heating. We can counter that with better insulation of properties. We need it for lighting, so we can start finding alternative ways of generating that. And of course, we can start to extract energy from the waste that cities produce. And of course, we can start installing smart windows. And these were announced fairly recently in China. I'm hoping all cities, all windows in cities by 2050 will not only be smart windows reflecting heat back into the room in winter from the room heat that's been generated inside, reflecting heat away in summer so it doesn't come through and have to be reduced by air conditioning. And they've also found a way of making windows generate their own supply of electricity. Now again, this is done in Beijing. They've devised these windows using polyaniline nanowires in them to generate power so we, all windows will be plugged into the system generating power, not just things sitting on your roof, your windows and cells will be good. One way, of course, we can generate power in, in cities is from methane. Now, I come from a part of the world in Bedford where every week they come round and they collect all our kitchen refuse, our food refuse. And this goes to a company called Biogen. And Biogen have got these enormous fermenters. It goes into these fermenters. A company buy all the waste food that comes from supermarkets that they can't sell. They've even got a machine there which strips off plastic from supermarket food. Goes into the great digesters, produces methane, stored in that dome-shaped bubble, and then it's used, burnt to produce electricity. And when, of course, the system is spent in one of these generators, the liquid, is resourced, the liquid that's there is used as a resource. It's pumped to surrounding farms to be used as fertiliser. 
So I can see all over Britain there will be such uh, biogen things. I think there are two already in Britain, but thankfully we, we live near one of them and it, it does seem to be working. We can also, of course, collect old methane from landfill sites. If you install, if you cover a landfill site with a membrane, you can pump out the methane that's coming off it all the time, and you can get about 250 cubic meters of biogas a day, and that will generate about 60 kilowatt hours of energy. The company that does that in Britain is called Alkane, and they're doing it more and more. And in fact, in one of these sites, a really enormous site in Surrey, it's being the methane isn't then used to burnt to generate electricity. It's actually used as a fuel in its own right. And it produces 5,000 tonnes of liquid biomethane a year, and that is used to fuel specially adapted lorries. There's the site. But of course, it's useful is this. It's pointless letting this methane go to waste. But of course, it, ultimately, it's not sustainable. I mean, a lot of these sites will continue to give off methane perhaps for another two or 300 years. But in the end, it's not sustainable. But we can use it while it is. Another thing is a company called TMO Renewables. And I can see this being in every town and city in Britain eventually. It used to convert cellulose directly to bioethanol. So in a city, it would be possible to produce, collect all the cardboard, the wave paper, everything that's basically cellulose, leaves, straw, and process it to bioethanol. Now, if that were done in a city, it would actually generate quite a lot of fuel. A city of about a million people throws away about 100,000 tonnes of carbon-rich waste a year. <coughs> Most of it, of course, nothing. It gets, we get no benefit from it. If we were to have a plant like TMO with every town and city, then we, at that a city of a million people could then generate about 15 million litres of fuel a year, enough to run about 35,000 cars. Of course, a city of that size will have something like 10, 000, 10 times that number of cars, so it's only making a contribution, but it's just quite a significant contribution. And of course, we'll be living in houses designed for the future. Here's the BASF house at Nottingham University. Very uh, energy safe, energy uh, useful. And of course, that relies on improved insulation. Now, chemists have come up with this rather nice form of insulation, in which you've got microcapsules of paraffin wax sacks inside a coating. And we're talking about now about micro-sized little particles. What happens is, if they're uh, used as insulation, when the temperature reaches 26 degrees, which is just getting a little bit too hot for comfort, the wax melts. And of course, as it melts, it absorbs latent energy. So the temperature doesn't rise above that. And then when the temperature changes and the room cools to 20 degrees, the wax then solidifies again. And as it solidifies, it gives out energy. So if you were to line a room with 40 one meter square panels of this, which is about the size of a normal room, then that would save energy equivalent to having a, a one bar electric fire in there working for 10 hours a day. So you can see if every room was surrounded by this type of insulation, and again, it's now been produced by BASF, it's called Micronal, and DuPont produces as N again, Modern houses, offices will have this, and it will be saving an enormous amount of fuel. We've even got an insulating plaster now in Huddersfield. Insa wall produces a plaster, so when you plaster your walls, it will be much more insulating than the old-fashioned type of plaster, and it can be used both inside and outside. So that's what also will make a contribution. LEDs for lighting, that's of course we expect that to happen. It's already happening. LEDs consume far less energy than other forms of lighting. And now, of course, we can get white light as LEDs. So you can expect modern homes in 2050 to be mainly illuminated by LEDs. It's even possible that our streets might be illuminated this way. There's an example of where you've got solar panels catching the sunlight, and it didn't always need to be direct sunlight. There are solar panels that can do indirect sunlight now. Storing that and then using it to fuel lights along that road, perhaps for half the evening, and they probably would go out about midnight. But again, this could be done, it would be perfectly sustainable. Well, those are my views of what's, hap what's likely to happen by 2050. Now I'm gonna expose you to some propaganda. I'm proud to be a chemist. 
Chemists can work wonders, but we can't work miracles. I've shown you that some of the things we can do and some of the things we're not going to be able to do. It's quite an intellectually challenging science, this chemistry. So if you hear somebody wanting to become a chemist, don't for goodness sake use words like geek. Give them your support. And I think, you know, what chemists have done to a country like Britain, we can do for the rest of the world. The target is to do it sustainably. If everybody in the world could enjoy this standard of living sustainably, then it'll have to come, I think, through the chemistry route. We rely very heavily on young people with vision. Some of the problems I've been talking about will need to be solved. They're the vital part of the future, so we need them. I'm also proud to be part of the SCI, because this is the only learned society that brings together scientists, technologists from academia, industry and the public sector. I believe we've got the capacity to be leadership in five areas of sustainability, the ones I've been talking about, and I'd like to think this society will be doing that. How could we do it? Well, we've got to encourage all our subject groups to become, to take this on their agenda, devise simpler and cheaper technologies, encourage members to think up new and technological approaches, get the message across of what we've already achieved, and I think we can have a sustainable future going down the scientific route. Now, if you'd like to read more about this, I have a book. <laughs> I wrote it with the Royal Society of Chemistry. I've written a lot of popular science books, but I thought it'd be rather nice just to do that. I know they say you should never try and predict what's going to happen, but I feel that we have a choice to make. We have to go down this route, and that brings me to the end of the talk. But I've also written another book. I've written a short novel putting over the ideas in a different way. Um, there it is. I've only had a few copies printed, but it's now as an e-book on Amazon. And the idea is, it's a couple who live in Islington. They're set out, determined to be green. They're going to have nothing to do with mass-produced food. It's going to be organic, no chemicals. They go th that's what it is. And it's how slowly, as the days go by or the months go by, they suddenly realise, or slowly realise, that chemists have actually found the answer to a lot of their problems. So, as I say, I'm trying that because it's a different audience to the uh, scientific popular science book. This is just a bit of a fun novel. And thank you very much for listening. Right at the front, so we'll start from, start from the front. Well, I mean, the, there are vast coal deposits, there are vast oil deposits. There are a lot of methane uh, in shale. The, the, I mean, Canada's got an enormous... The uh, Athabasca uh, sands contain probably more carbon locked away in them than all the oil in the Middle East. So there's a lot out there. Of course, a lot of it we can't get. It's too diffuse. That's what makes oil so attractive. It just gushes out of the ground. Well, I mean, and we can release methane, of course, now by fracking, as it's called. So we're going to be able to continue doing that. But the problem is, of course, if we go down that route, it's not going to be many decades before we cannot afford to live with what we're doing because it will be melting the ice caps, it will be melting glaciers, sea levels will be rising. So that's one thing which I think will probably stop us doing it, but there's still plenty of carbon out there that we can use. Yeah. We're told, of course, that the big benefit of nuclear energy is that there's no carbon release from it. And, of course, there are presumably parts of the world. I think India's looking to generate nuclear energy from thorium as a resource rather than from uranium. And I think in Russia they're looking to do research in that direction. And of course for an island like Britain, it's particularly, or like France, it's particularly attractive because we could almost be sustainable without importing lots of fossil fuels. I mean, I believe in, in France something like 80% of their electricity is generated that way. But I can see for Japan, it's, you've got to ask yourself the risk, as we, we saw with the disaster, that this is perhaps not the way forward for you. But for perhaps stable parts of the world where there is no risk of earthquakes destroying or releasing um, uh, radioactive materials, then it, it's going to be what's... What, I mean, it's bound to happen, I think, because a country like Britain, you know, we, we, could, we could import vast amounts. We could release, I'm told, vast amounts of methane from fracking in Lancashire. There's, you know, supposed to be an enormous amount there. But it's, it's a curious debate, isn't it? I mean, plants need it. I mean, ideally, we've, we'll eventually not stop mining it. We'll have to reclaim it from the, plant, the biomass that plants have absorbed. 
I mean, if you're going to harvest a field and take that off to burn that, of course, you'd end up with potash, which is fine. If you're going to use it to make plastics, again, you'll be able to reclaim the potassium. It's the food that ends up in cities, then the potassium then drifts off down the, the sewage system. Now, it, it's not beyond the wit of man to find a way of getting that potassium back. I mean, potassium chloride is not particularly soluble, so you might get it, some of it back that route. And, of course, I think there are probably other ways of doing it, and it just requires somebody the will to do it. But since it's so cheap and these deposits are so, so vast, like the booby mine in Yorkshire, there's going to be no incentive for a long time, I don't think. But, it, you know, strictly speaking, if we want to be totally sustainable, then we have to stop mining it. But I don't think that's actually going to, to happen by 2050, and probably not by 2150. Well, you're quite true, it would require uh, monocultures, but not on the scale of the Great Plains of, of America, I don't think, where, you know, mile after mile after mile is just one crop. I think in a country like Britain, of course, we've been in crop rotation now for a long time, haven't we? So I don't think it would threaten us, although, as you quite rightly point out, if some country decides to go down the route of... of but has it affected Brazil as a monoculture? Has it had serious impacts there, I'm not sure. Precisely. Yes, you're making a very good point there because I think large swathes of Indonesia were cleared, jungle was cleared just to plant uh, palm oil trees. Again, yes, no, it's quite a good point. We don't want to go down the route because then, of course, you expose yourself to another risk, don't you? You know, if, if a disease was to sweep through a particular crop, then you're in real trouble, yeah. yeah. No, you're making a very good point because you cannot... If you're going to reclaim a plastic like PVC, then you want it just as PVC to be reclaimed. I mean, you can take out old window frames, you can take the PVC, you can turn it into garden chairs or in fencing. If you recycle that, you can recycle it to drains or something like that. But of course, you can't mix that with polythene. You can't mix that with other plastics. Now, there are, there are uh, places where there's automatic separation. As the plastic goes along a thing, I think it's analysed by infrared and it's flicked off at various points. Now, whether that works, I've, I've read about this, but I don't know if it's done. I think most people just gather the plastic, shred it all up, and make plastic board of it, which is used in, in building. You know, you, previously they used wood. You know, you put your two pieces of wood, you fill it full of concrete, and that's how it sets. But that wood then is thrown away. I think they're now making this of plastics. But this is just jumbled up plastics, all pressed together, melted till it forms a solid material. But that's not really sustainable is it you've got to separate the plastics into ways in which you can regenerate that particular plastic and again that's something that is going to i mean it's it's easy perhaps for some uh, polyesters we know we can take gather all the polyester bottles that we use and turn those into fabrics and and rugs which we do uh, into carpets which we do but you've got to be absolutely certain that you've got the pure plastic there before you do that if you get other forms in then it becomes unworkable but again, ways of doing that, rather than just having people picking it out, it is possible to mechanise that, and then it, perhaps it would work. But you make a very good point, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's a very telling point, this, isn't it? You know, maybe after all, we have one of the greatest chemical companies in the world, and where's that gone? You know. That's because it decided it needed to make profits. That's right, it's split up and it's fragmented and fragmented. Um, but I don't know, I mean, as you say, you know, my message is, of course, we need young people to come up with design. Your message is, of course, those things then have to follow into, uh, into companies which will generate this and we can perhaps even sell that technology around the world. My simple message is, let's try and make this a sustainable island and let that be the example to the world. But, of course, you're quite right, we'd have to import lots of things in order to make it like wind energy from Denmark and things like this, yes. No. It's tricky. Leave that to the economists, I'm afraid. Or the bankers, yes. So. Well, yes, I mean, that you're making the right point. You know, if you take any biomass and you heat it, you can paralyse it. You can end up... People still do produce charcoal, don't they? And, of course, charcoal is just carbon. And, of course, the easiest thing to do with carbon is then to turn it into syngas. Because, you, you know, it just uh, superheated steam and, and that will just produce syngas. But you're quite right, you can actually use it as a sort of fertiliser, can't you? But it's not a fertiliser in the normal sense, is it? 
It's, you know, it's not adding nutrients to the plants. It's, it's conditioning the soil slightly better. Um, but I mean, you know, the, the one thing about uh, biomass, of course, we can produce it in any quantity we want. What we do with it after that, of course, as you say, there are all sorts of ways we can process it. But, you know, that's your generation's little challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I, have great f I have great faith in young people because <laughs> I think they can look back and see, you know, when you go back, to, go back to 1960, the dooms and gloomsters were saying by the end of the century, we'll be fighting for land, we'll be fighting for water, people will be starving. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen mainly for reasons I've explained. I'd like to think that where we stand now, that the similar thing will, in another 40 years' time, they'll look back and they'll say, well, why were they so pessimistic? Look what we've done. Now, whether it'll occur, I don't know. On that very positive note, I'd like you all to, to join me in thanking John for a, a, a fantastic... Oh, thank you.